Um, and so just recognize forgetting isn't always a bad thing. We're actually going to watch a video um, here that looks at a woman. Her name is Jill Price, who cannot forget anything about her own life. It's out of her. She has like an unparalleled autobiographical memory. But when we're thinking about forgetting, um, it poses the question of like, would it be helpful or beneficial or good to have a brain that stored information like a computer does so that we could easily retrieve any stored item? Um, what would that feel like, right? Would it, would it, um, would there be any problems, right? If we remembered everything, maybe we could not prioritize important memories, the things that are most important to us, right? We just had everything in there, right? Not, um, our wedding day being a, a more significant date than last Tuesday, right? We might have difficulty thinking abstractly or making connections if our brain was devoted to compiling just isolated bits of information. Um, so with that, there's a few things that could potentially lead to forgetting, right? I referenced that on that chart that I've shown you like 8,000 times in this memory section, um, that failure can happen at the encoding storage or retrieval levels. Um, we can see forgetting being caused by brain damage and encoding failure, storage decay, retrieval failure, any sort of interference. Um, and then there is such thing as motivated uh, forgetting as well. So we are going to just start looking at forgetting as a kind of topic by watching this um, Good Morning America interview with Joe Price, who has an unbelievable autobiographical memory and remembers everything that has ever happened in her life. What is it like for most of us to try to remember our lives? Scientists say most of us can remember, what, 20, 30, 40 emotional events, powerful days in our lives as it goes by. But you're going to meet a woman with a one-of-a-kind memory that allows her to replay her life like a movie, recalling each day in detail, emotional detail. Researchers say it is an autobiographical memory that is simply unmatched. Scientists at the University of California, Irvine, have been studying it for eight years, and she has kept her identity a secret all that time. But now she is ready to talk on GMA and in a new book called The Woman Who Can't Forget. They call her AJ. The subject of most medical studies are usually anonymous. She's a woman with the most amazing memory known to science. By understanding how her brain does this, we may help write a new chapter of memory research. It's gotten to be just like any reference. I mean, you go to the internet, you look in an encyclopedia, or you ask my sister. AJ remembers details of what she did every single day since she was 14, instantly recalling dates of news events in her lifetime. She has the ability at, in a split second to tell you dates, times, what she was doing, what we were doing, what was happening in history. It's hard to describe. For her, being able to forget isn't easy. She became a fascination around the world, the human calendar. Doctors, journalists wanting to meet her. Her voice heard on the radio just once. If I'm able to cure a disease, it's a gift. But to remember, like, the end of every, end of every relationship or, you know, anything, it's, it's, it's hard. But it has formed who I am because I remember everything. Until now, she's been anonymous, dealing with the interest in her brain, her life, almost too much for her to bear. She chose not to reveal herself to the world uh, for several years. You can imagine it yourself. Uh, if, if suddenly the whole world knows about you, there's a lot of people out there. And we are joined now by AJ, who is really Jill Price. We're saying it on television. A 42-year-old school administrator from Los Angeles. And as I said, it is her first ever live appearance on television. And we had a chance to sit down earlier and do a taped interview. Good morning Good to morning. you again. Can I throw some more questions? Sure. I love that you don't mind <laughs> that we keep testing this way. All right. I know television is one of the things that that you remember the, what you saw on television on the days in your lives. So, when, when was J.R. shot on Dallas? When he was shot, or when did you find out who was, he was shot, who shot him? Oh, uh, he was okay. shot on March 21st, 1980, and we found out November 21st, 1980. What about uh, the end of All in the Family? Mm. 
Well, that was in 19, March, of, March of 1978. What about Nancy Kerrigan attacked? Something that interested you? January 6, 1994. Oh, Lord, you're right. <laughs> the L.A. riots. They started on April 29, 1992. Unabomber arrested? Ted Kaczynski arrested? Uh, April 3rd or 4th, 1996. April 4th, yeah. 1996. <laughs> and you will see tonight, I'm reading from the book. I take this book and go through it. And you correct the book, mm -hmm. and you are right mm -hmm. at times. I think I have you, and mm -hmm. you are right. Yeah, I told you that. I know you told me. <laughs> you warned me, but I didn't believe you. And a lot of people didn't at first, including the scientists, when they first met you. They were astonished, too. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what it is to be inside your brain, because I am trying to imagine, most of us cannot, what it is to have your history playing in your brain at the same time you're living in the present tense. Describe it. Well, like right now, I'm in the present moment talking to you, but I have a split screen in my head where I have a loop of memories just free-flowing all the time. So simultaneously, your, the calendar of the past is going mm -hmm. through. And details like what you had for lunch? Well, I can remember that. But that's, I mean, it just Just it pick could a be day anything. and tell me something you remember for lunch. Um, May 27th, 2006. What'd you have? I had... <laughs> BLT and a tomato soup. Well, I want to tell everybody that this can be checked if you think it's just random. Show the journals up here, if you will, everyone. Jill has kept 50,000 pages of journals every day of her life. So I to say, even if you wanted to memorize them, you couldn't memorize mm -hmm. them. You can go back and check, and as you'll see tonight, you even remember hairspray incidents <laughs> and what day they occurred on in what year. Does this mean you were good in school? I was not good in school. See, this is inconceivable. You, you didn't have the ability to take a poem and then suddenly recall it? My memory is autobiographical. So I could tell you my life, but to memorize a poem or a monologue was very excruciating for me. Which raises this old question that we have talked about a lot, which is we all think it would be bliss mm -hmm. to be able to remember every day of our lives. Is it more of a comfort or a burden? It's both. Tell me about the burden. Tell me about what it is to be able to remember every single painful incident in your life. It's horrendous. Small things. Uh -huh. Everything. You know, I, regrets, choices. I mean, I could literally go back to the exact moment I, made, I was in that fork in the road where I could have made this choice, but I made this choice, and then that leads to this, which leads to that, and I just can't, I can't forget that. So contrary to all of us who can maybe remember 365 days of whole periods of our lives, you remember 365 a year, and does this mean that you actually get trapped in time? Like a, I travel something in, in amber. my head. You travel mm -hmm. in your head. That's what I call it. Everyone thinks, again, you could take this ability, go on Jeopardy and earn a lot of money. I or, could if it were stuff that I was interested in. But it has to be things that you were interested mm -hmm. in because it's about your own. Because I relate it to where I was and what was going on in my life. Like that's like the Princess Grace thing. The Princess Grace moment mm -hmm. tonight when mm -hmm. I thought I had it right. And by the way, the book mm -hmm. has it wrong. Uh, a question about those around you. Has anybody, has anybody come up with anything, the scientists yet? that has helped you file it away, file the memory away? No. I don't think they ever can, because it's my brain, so how can they... You can't make your brain stop, so I don't... Unless, I mean, short of a lobotomy, I don't really think that there's anything that could be done for me. Good things just got better. Introducing an all-new third hour of Good Morning America. Welcome to Good Morning America Now. Good Morning America Now. Good Morning America Now. On ABC News Now. Get your Good Morning America Now at abcnewsnow.com. So Jill Price, kind of a extraordinary example. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about these two different types of amnesia. They're pretty straightforward um, and pretty definitional. I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty behind them. Um, but these are types of memory loss that, that somebody could potentially have. There's retrograde amnesia and anterograde amnesia. 
Um, retrograde, think like old school, but like retro in the in the past. Um, retrograde amnesia refers to an inability to retrieve memories of the past, right? You might have a, a stroke or a ble brain bleed or some other sort of brain damage that makes it so you can't remember what's happened in your past. Think like, um, oh, what's that movie with Rachel McAdams? She gets in a car crash and she can't remember. I can't remember. Think that movie <laughs> um, if you've seen it. But she gets in a car crash and she like wakes up and she doesn't remember her husband. She doesn't remember um, like her, her wedding day or like what she does for a living and all that good stuff. But she can create new memories, which is different from anterograde amnesia, which is people who cannot um, form new long-term memories. So people who might have some sort of brain damage that disallows them from like creating new memories. You may remember everything up until your accident, um, but you can't remember anything after that accident. If you've seen the movie Memento, that would be an example of um, anterograde amnesia. Um, so these are just two types of, of like diagnoses as they pertain to forgetting. Um, that you're just gonna have to kind of know the difference between. With that, I want you to take a second and I want you to look at these pennies. Well, pretty abrupt transition, regardless. Um, look at these pennies and I want you to tell me which of these has the design of an actual US cent. All right, so the answer is actually this one. Um, and this is kind of a retrieval and a recognition test, right? Um, in terms of retrieval, the question is what words, numbers, and which locations are the front of a US cent coin? Um, this should be easy because, um, well, you don't read the textbook, but it was in the textbook. Um, and when we're talking about retrieval, you know that these all look like a a penny, right? Um, but recognition, choose the correct design among these pictures, right? If you had to uh, recall it, I would be asking you to like draw me a picture of a scent, whereas this is an example of recognition in which you have kind of a multiple choice, which of these is a good example. Um, and so with that in mind, a couple of reasons why you may not have picked the correct penny in this example, right? You may have gone through an encoding failure, right? If you're looking here, you have this external event, you have a sensory memory, right? You see a coin, you pay attention to it, or you maybe don't pay attention to it, right? And it goes into your working memory. I know that's a penny, right? And maybe our understanding of a penny is that it's like small, skinny, and bronze, right? Um, it's not silver like some of the other coins. Um, and so therefore, we don't think about the actual detail on the penny and we go undergo an encoding failure and what that pe penny actually looks like and which direction the head is facing and where the date is, like doesn't go into our long-term memory, right? We, why did, and so anyway, the question is why do we re re fail to retrieve the information, right? It's be, maybe because we never paid attention to the details or we may have once looked at a penny and paid attention to it, but we didn't rehearse it, so we never encoded it into our long-term memory, right? Another reason why we may have forgotten which penny was correct, right, is storage decay, right? And material encoded into long-term memory will dec decay if the memory is never used, recalled, or restored. Um, decay um, in our in our long-term memory um, can be seen from this graph. Wow, I got very distracted right then. <laughs> um, here we see that the fact that decay actually seems to like level off-ish um, because we tend to remember something or like really study for like a Spanish test in this example, right? Like and we remember all of our conjugations and all the vocab and like all the grammatical pieces and how to verbalize that. But then like in a short time after we start to forget that and then we really only remember the stuff that we practice time and time again, right? Um, so yeah.
look at then a, a video that looks at the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Um, if you've ever been like, oh, I know this, I know this, I know this, I know this, it's right there, it's right in the front of my brain, but you just can't remember, right? That is a very widely studied phenomenon in psychology. Um, and this video is gonna give you a little bit of insight into why that is. Um, the reason that we're talking about it right here, right? It's retrieval. It's our inability to remember something. We're forgetting something. We can't produce information that we feel we should be able to produce. So um, here's one piece of the puzzle as it pertains to forgetting. We all know it, the intense frustration, the deep self-loathing when a word is stuck it's right on the tip of your tongue. Researchers have been studying this phenomenon since the 1960s, hoping for some relief, and finally, thanks to science, we have salvation. The words presque vu, meaning almost seen, describe that thing where you can almost say a word, you're positive, you know it, and if I just give you like half a second, you'd be able to say it, but no, you totally never get it. And the French term provides a nice dose of always appreciated culture, and I use it because the English one doesn't exist. Not because I can't think of it, it's just we don't, we don't have a word for it. According to researchers, tip of the tongue states, or tots, happen all the time, an infuriating once a week for most of us, which increases to about once daily as we age. They span most languages, from Arabic to Afrikaans, and in the worst cases they're accompanied by blockers, or so-called ugly sisters. Like when you're trying to think of Van Gogh, and all you can think of is Vin Diesel. To understand tip of the tongue states, scientists combine theories in neuroscience and computer science into what's known as connectionist models. These describe the ways we can use computers to simulate how neurons in our brains handle language. In these models, the brain is represented as a network of connected nodes, processing centers that are kind of like individual computers. Even though the connectionist models describe things in terms of networks and nodes, they're a lot like how our brains actually work. In 1949, a psychologist named Donald Hebb proposed a theory to explain how neurons in the brain change through experience to encode new information. It's how we learn. In both connectionist models and neuroscience, as you have a thought, particular clusters of neurons or nodes are activated, meaning they start sending signals to each other. Activation then spreads from higher, more complex clusters to lower ones in patterns that seem unpredictable at first, but after a while, it's not unpredictable at all. Activating certain clusters when you have a thought actually physically changes the connections between them, making it more likely they'll activate together again. It's like a path in the woods. The more it's used, the more defined the path gets. And while learning is all well and good, it doesn't mean much if you can't cough up all the knowing good stuff when it comes to time to. Retrieving the knowledge starts at the highest level clusters, the one containing semantic, or meaning, information. Then the activation spreads down to the lowest level clusters, containing phonological, or sound information. So say you want to talk about King Arthur's sword. First, a higher level cluster would light up, and that would spread down to the clusters for each sound in Excalibur. A tip of the tongue state is what happens when the meaning clusters light up, but the sound clusters don't activate completely, because the signal in your brain takes a detour instead of following the right path. That's why you can often describe describe characteristics of the word, and not the whole word itself. It's like, it starts with S, or it rhymes with Snortzenbagger when you're trying to remember who played the Terminator. Actually, I was playing a game with my mom recently, and she was trying to think of Uma Thurman, and she said Erna Thulman, which... I'm never gonna let her live that down. And as it turns out, having someone tell you the word is probably doing more harm than good. In something the researchers call the resolution effect, coming to the word yourself makes it more likely that your brain will reinforce the correct pathway for meaning to sound activation. So the next time someone asks you to help them with a word, you might want to look them in the eye and say no. You're never gonna learn that way. But there are other ways to help them. Researchers have found that giving a person in a TOT state a hint about the word, for example like, Arn, if you're going for Arnold Schwarzenegger, helps them establish the right connections in their brain. And then next time it'll be easier for them to come up with the word or the person's name on their own. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, which was brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. If you want to help support this show so we can keep making more of them and making them better so that you will enjoy them and enjoy them more and just watch more and share them with all your friends and seem like a really smart person, you can go to patreon.com slash scishow. And if you just want to keep watching them, go to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribe. So there's the tip of the tongue phenomenon. This slide I actually just took from the textbook um, slide um, because I, I want to talk about the difference between um, proactive interference and retroactive interference because you have to know them. 
Um, but I want to just kind of breeze over it pretty quickly. Um, so take a second, read through this slide. I'll talk about, you just pause it, read through it, jot down any ideas that you think are important. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about proactive and on the next slide, retroactive interference. So proactive interference occurs when past information interferes with learning new information. So that's something like, I remember when I was in high school, my mom taught AP stats, but I wasn't in her class. And like every time she tried to help me with my homework, I'd be like, well, that's not how Mr. Breen taught me, right? And so like how Mr. Breen taught it and like the methodology that he used made it very difficult for me to learn a different method of approaching a AP stats um, written problem or whatever, right? You may have strong memories of previous principle. This memory t makes it difficult to learn the new principal's name, right? You had to change email passwords, but you keep trying the old one and you can't seem to memorize the new one. Um, you may have grown up in within a society with everything going on in, in the world today with all of the Black Lives Matter protests and all of the um, riots and the police brutality that we've been kind of um, exposed to on a, a greater scale within the last couple of weeks, right? Think about proactive interference, right? We've, many people have been living their lives in a certain way, whether you are black or white or Indian or um, Hispanic or Asian, whatever you might um, identify as, right? You've experienced the world in a certain way. Um, and because of that learning and how you've learned and how you've learned to interact with your world and what is expected of you, right, it's really difficult to start a conversation about race, especially when it pertains to people who have uh, white privilege. It can be very, very difficult for people to talk about and learn other perspectives and how to better engage in an actively anti-racist way within society. Um, this is just kind of me talking about like current events and connecting it back to psychology. So obviously there's like a lot more to this conversation, but I do think it's important to recognize the like greater ramifications that something like proactive interference and in memory can in fact have in on like a more societal and, and large scale um, way and, and impact. So with that um, kind of heavy note, I'm going to shift and look retrograde amnesia here, or sorry, retrograde interference. Oh, retroactive interference, Sarah, get it. Um, so we'll talk retroactive, look at a summary, and then watch one last video of the misinformation effect. So retroactive interference occurs when new stimuli or learning interferes with the storage or retrieval of previously formed memories. Right. Um, one study, students who studied right before eight hours of sleep had better recall than those who studied before eight hours of daily activity. So studying at night um, was more beneficial than studying right away in the morning because if you studied in the morning, you had to do a bunch of stuff. You had to maybe maybe you were studying for psychology and then you had to go to math and then you had to go to gym and then you had to go to um AP Lang, and then you went to psychology and all of that other brain activity made it difficult to remember what you had studied right away in the morning for psychology, right? The daily activities retroactively interfered with the morning's learning. Uh, so you have um, this idea of proactive interference, past experiences um, interfering with creating new memories, and then you have retroactive new experiences making it difficult to remember old um, understand. With that then, here's our little summary. We have um, our sensory memory that has, right, you see here, a lot of dots, a lot of information bits. And as it goes into our working memory, we see less dots, less information, right? And then long term, we even know even more. And then being able to retrieve that, we know even um, or even fewer little information bits. So forgetting can occur at any memory stage. As we process information, we filter, alter, or lose much of it. Um, and that's why the relearning process is so important. The last slide here, I just kind of added this on because there's there was a whole list of things that the textbook said um, you needed to know about like specific instances of forgetting. 
that aren't really all that important. Um, so I just wanted to reference this one specifically because you will need to know it. Um, and I'm actually gonna let the, the video speak more to it. I just have this um, image here so that if you wanna write down some ideas, um, you are more than welcome to. So we'll watch this video. That'll be the last thing that we do for this lecture, <laughs> for our very last lecture. Okay, the misinformation effect, here you go. Hold on, hold on. Have you done this before? What about this? It's only human to want to capture memories. But that doesn't mean that's how our memory actually works. In fact, there's more than one kind of memory. When we talk about memories of events, we're talking about episodic memory. We create episodic memories by encoding sensory information from the world into our brains. These become memory traces, which are stored until they are retrieved, a fancy word for remembering. However, you don't remember things exactly as they were. Memory is constructive. Each time you remember a memory, you're actually rebuilding it using mm. those memory traces and your mm. own guesswork. That's why psychologist Elizabeth Loftus compares memory to a Wikipedia page. You can edit it, but that means other people can too. And they're not always right. <laughs> when a memory is distorted by wrong information before it's retrieved, this is known as the misinformation effect. Literally hundreds of studies have shown the misinformation effect. In one study, Loftus and her colleagues showed people slides of a car accident. Then, they asked the participants questions about the scene. Some were given a question with misleading information that mentions a yield instead of a stop sign, while some saw a question with consistent information. Later, those who were misinformed were about 20% more likely hmm. to incorrectly report that they saw a yield sign compared to those who received the correct information. Mm -hmm. Taken to the extreme, misinformation can send an innocent person to jail. You wouldn't want to be in a police lineup with a misinformed eyewitness. Eyewitness memory is easily distorted if there are suggestive police procedures. For example, if a police officer unintentionally implies that the crook is in the lineup. When witnesses talk to each other, they also share information that might not be true. Despite this, Many jurors and judges are convinced that eyewitness evidence is the most persuasive kind of evidence out there. This has serious consequences. Out of the 314 prisoners who have since been proven innocent, almost three out of four were mistakenly identified by an eyewitness. Although no one is immune to the misinformation effect, young children and the elderly are the most prone to it. In addition, the effects are strongest after a long period of time, when the memory trace becomes so weak that we rely almost entirely on external information to reconstruct the memory.